So today we're going to talk about chemical reactions. We're going to talk about the chemistry of life, okay, the chemistry of life. Um, and basically, we want to be able to answer a couple questions. We want to be able to say, um, or we want to be able to identify, sorry, where we get uh, the chemical symbols for the elements, okay? We want to be able to define a chemical reaction and the parts of a chemical reaction, okay? We want to be able to um, identify the product side and the reactant side of the reaction. We want to be able to tell that apart based on which direction the arrow is pointing in the reaction itself. And we're going to talk a little bit about balancing, okay? Now, first, let's cover a couple things about atoms. So, um, things you may already know about atoms, all right? Uh, they are tiny, 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 right? And they are made of a couple parts. They have protons in the middle, and protons are positive, okay? So that's usually how we um, illustrate a proton, okay? And they are found in the nucleus. Um, we also have neutrons in the nucleus, okay? And you usually just draw them as a little particle with nothing in the middle, no charge, not a positive or a negative, okay? And if we're looking at probably one of the more simple elements, okay, like helium, which has two protons and two neutrons, usually, in the nucleus, um, we'll find that it also has two electrons that are orbiting, okay, in the first orbital outside uh, the nucleus. And so we usually draw that like this, okay? And this is called a Bohr, B-O-H-R, uh, model, okay, of an atom. Because in real life, electrons don't actually orbit like planets around the sun, um, but this is usually the way that we draw them, okay? So... Anytime you look at the periodic table, okay, and the periodic table has, um, you know, numbers. Let me grab a periodic table. Hold on, just a second. So our periodic table has, you know, numbers uh, at the bottom underneath the element, like whole numbers. So they go one, two. Um, about 118 on newer periodic tables. That number at the bottom, so like magnesium is 12, sodium is 11, hydrogen is one, helium is two. That number is called the atomic number. And the atomic number is based on how many protons there are, okay? The atomic mass is based on how many protons and neutrons there are, okay? So a proton is considered to be um, one AMU, so one P plus, that's the abbreviation for proton, is one atomic mass unit, that's what that stands for, and a neutron, which is N0, neutron starts with N, has zero charge, is also one AMU, okay? And so I'm um, looking at helium, which this is helium up here, HE, uh, we would expect it to have a mass around four AMU because electrons are so small, they don't really have a mass. We don't uh, calculate it, that's how small it is, okay? You will learn a lot more about that in chemistry class, but from biology, basically all we want to know is this. Atoms have protons and neutrons in the middle. They have electrons uh, in the electron cloud around the nucleus. Uh, electrons are really small. They basically don't weigh anything. Um, protons and neutrons both weigh about the same. So the mass of an element, the mass of an atom, comes from its protons and its neutrons. Now, when you look at an element symbol, okay, you're going to notice that it's always one or two letters. So if we hold this thing back up here, see like there's an element that has one letter as a symbol. Here's an element that has two letters as a symbol, okay? And something that you should always be able to identify is when you start a new element. So vanadium, right, vanadium, the symbol for vanadium is V. It's capitalized. The first letter is always capitalized, okay? Um, for chromium, the uh, abbreviation is CR, okay? So the first letter is always capitalized. The second letter is always lowercase. So when I look at carbon, I know I'm talking about carbon because I have a big capital C. Oxygen is a big O. But if I saw this, CO, next to each other, this tells me this is not carbon and oxygen. This must be two different, or, sorry, one thing. This is, in fact, cobalt, okay? So it's important that we know the first letter is capitalized, the second letter is lowercase, and they're always one or two letters, never more than one or two. 
And we use these in order to draw chemical reactions, okay? And a chemical reaction is a represent, or sorry, a chemical equation is a representation of those chemical reactions. So one that we're going to talk a lot about in here is uh, cell respiration and photosynthesis, okay? Because they're actually the same reaction, just in different directions. Uh, so C6H12O6, that's sugar, glucose, plus oxygen that you breathe in the air, O2, yields, and this arrow is really important, CO2 and water, all right? So this would be a chemical reaction. Now, in this chemical reaction, we are making new bonds between atoms because we have broken old bonds, okay? Um, anytime you're breaking chemical bonds, you have to have a reaction, okay? Chemical bonds don't break unless there's a reaction. Whenever you have two or more elements bonded together, you have a molecule. So CO2 is a molecule. It looks like this. It's carbon in the middle with double bonds to oxygen. O2 um, actually looks like that, okay? Uh, glucose is six carbons in a ring, single bonds between them, it makes a hexagon, and they alternate with an OH above and an OH below. It's a very complex molecule um, all the way around, okay, like that. And water, hopefully you've seen water before. Uh, water looks like that. Now you'll notice that there are these dots on the outside of these um, atom drawings that I'm doing. Those are lone pair electrons. We'll talk more about those later. Uh, but you may see those at times, okay? So the pictorial representation of what's going on here would look something like that, but this is the chemical reaction that we write, okay? So we've got the chemical reaction because bonds are being broken and new bonds are being made. Whenever you break bonds, you change the composition of the elements. So we have sugar over here on the left. We do not have sugar over here on the right, okay? We have carbon dioxide, we have water. A couple of bonds we'll talk about throughout the year. Um, covalent bonds are when we share electrons. So carbon dioxide is a great example of a covalent bond. This is the Lewis diagram for carbon dioxide. It's a linear molecule. It's carbon in the middle, two oxygens on the end. And you'll learn how to draw those in chemistry. We don't have to draw them in this class. Um, but it's worth looking at, be able to go, okay, well, that's one carbon, so C. And that's two oxygens, so... O2, hey, that's carbon dioxide, we know what that is, okay? Um, this is a covalent bond. It's a really strong uh, bond. In an ionic bond, we have uh, actually the transfer of electrons, and ionic bonds are how we make salts, okay? And salts are really important in biology. So table salt is NaCl, sodium chloride. That's the salt that you put on your food. Um, it's also a really important salt for um, your body to be able to do the things that it's supposed to do, okay? Now, occasionally, all right, it's worth noting um, that ionic bonds and covalent bonds are not the same thing. Um, occasionally, that will come up in biology, maybe advanced, more advanced biology. It will definitely come up in chemistry. Let me just give you a head start. Covalent bonds are always made between two non-metals, okay? And Ionic bonds are always made between one metal, all right, and one non-metal. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, how do I figure that out? Well, on the periodic table, if we just draw like a rough periodic table, looks something like this, okay? There's the staircase. Everything to the right of the staircase is a non-metal. Everything to the left of the staircase is a metal. So sodium is about right there. Chlorine is over here. So I have a metal and a non-metal. That tells me, hey, this is an ionic bond. Ions have a charge. Sodium forms a plus one. Chlorine forms a minus one. And so in order for them to come together and join, their charges have to cancel out. Well, you just need one of each. So that gives us NaCl. We'll learn a lot more about that when you take chemistry. Okay, uh, but it's worth having just a little foundational knowledge. 
And the last kind of bonds we're going to talk about, and, and this will be constantly in biology, are hydrogen bonds. They're not real bonds like electrons are being shared or electrons are being transferred. This is more like just a force of attraction, kind of like a magnet. So when you put a magnet together, you can take it back apart, right? And that's the same thing with a hydrogen bond. And the way a hydrogen bond works is um, you have to have hydrogen and it has to be around a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. One of the ways we remember hydrogen bonding is to say it's fun, right? Um, and what that looks like is this. So if I have two water molecules, well, those dots around the oxygen are electrons, and we know electrons are negative. So looking at a water molecule, I can tell this end is probably kind of negative, okay? Um, because that's negative, this end's probably kind of positive, and positives and negatives attract. So between this hydrogen, I'm going to change my pen color here real quick. Between this hydrogen right here and this oxygen, there is a force of attraction. Now, we never, ever, ever show it as a... Um, as a straight line, as a true bond. So what we do is we draw it like this. So we have oxygen with our hydrogens. Draw little dots. There's our other water molecule. Okay. And then we show it as a dashed line from negative to positive. So this symbol means partial. All right. It's a Greek letter delta means partial negative. On the hydrogen, there's a partial positive, and we know that positives and negatives attract. There's a word for that. It's called electrostatic, right? That means opposite charges attract. So hydrogen bonds are electrostatic. That's something that we want to know. All right, now I've talked about water, right? Here's the formula for water, H2O. You've seen uh, NaCl. We've talked about, um, what was it a second ago? CO2. Okay, we even talked about C6H12O6, right? So glucose. So let's look at some of these chemical formulas, right? Um, a chemical formula shows the number of elements and atoms that are in a molecule, right? And it does that using these subscripts, Okay. A subscript is a smaller letter that's written below, right? Sub means below, script means to write. It's written below the element symbol. So a subscript tells you how many of each atom there are. So in this case, we have H2SO4. I have two hydrogens, I have one sulfur, and I have four oxygen atoms. So in this one molecule, there are seven total atoms. You might be wondering what that looks like. Well, sulfuric acid, which is what H2SO4 is, it's actually a very complex molecule. It looks like this. All right. Just like that, okay? Um, you don't have to know how to draw it, but it's, it's worth looking at, okay? Molecules are complicated things. They, are, they have a structure, they have an arrangement, they have a function, okay? Now, what we want to know about this, okay, is really simple. Can you figure out how many atoms there are? If you can tell me, hey, there are seven atoms together, then we're good. When we look at a balanced equation, we use coefficients to tell us how many molecules there are. Now remember, okay, molecules are the whole thing. This whole thing right here is a molecule. Right? And we usually abbreviate that MLC. Right? That's the abbreviation for molecule. If I put a subscript next to an atom, and that only changes how many atoms there are. But if I put a number out here, we call that a coefficient, that changes how many uh, molecules there are. And then we just use a little bit of algebra to figure out how many atoms there are in that problem, right? So for example, we've got two H2SO4. So we have two molecules of sulfuric acid. That's how we read that, okay? And if I want to say, all right, well, how many atoms are there now? Well, we distribute the coefficient, all right? This gets distributed. And remember, when you distribute, that means what? What math function, right? Multiply. So I look at this and say, all right, well, two times two gives me four hydrogens. 
two times one sulfur, right? Because if there's nothing there, there's a one, all right? Gives me one sulfur. And two times four gives me eight, all right? So I have eight oxygen atoms, two sulfur atoms, four hydrogen atoms. So if I count all that up, that would give me 14 atoms total. Well, that makes sense because a minute ago, we said that one molecule of sulfuric acid has seven atoms. So it makes sense that two molecules, right? Because this is telling me I have two molecules is going to equal 14 atoms. You can't lose atoms, right? They can't just disappear. So if you put a two out front, everything gets doubled. If you put a three out front, everything gets tripled. Okay, why do we care? What's important about that? Well, when you read a chemical reaction, there has to be coefficients there to balance the two sides, okay? And know the difference between a coefficient, which is to the, you know, the left of the number, and a subscript, which is or not to the left of the number, sorry, to the left of the molecule, and a subscript, right? This is a subscript, which only talks about how many atoms there are. The reason we need to do that is the law of conservation of mass, which I think we talk about in a different slide, okay? Um, but basically, I can't destroy atoms. I can only transform them. So if I look at this, I say, all right, on the left side, I have one carbon, I have four hydrogens, and I have four oxygens. And I know that I have four oxygens because two times two is four. On the product side, I've got one carbon. I've got two oxygens here, and I've got two times one. So two plus two times one is four. So I have four oxygens there, and I have two times two, four hydrogens. So we can see that this is a balanced equation. All right. There's the same amount of atoms on both sides, which is really, really important. When you read the two sides, the ones before the arrow are called reactants. So if we, we look at our um, here's an equation, N2 plus H2, oops, sorry. N2 plus H2 yields NH3. Now, this is not a balanced equation, but this is an equation. Nitrogen and hydrogen make ammonia. On the left, this side, these are my reactants because they are on the back of the arrow. And this is my product, okay, because the arrow always points at the product. So something to keep in mind, the arrow points at the products, okay? Now, you can write a, a reverse reaction. You could say N2 plus H2 is made by the breakdown of ammonia. This is a true statement. You can actually do that. But now, remember, the arrow points at the product, so this would be the products, and I would only have one reactant. That's fine. You just have to know which is which. So we're looking at this. We say, okay, Sodium and oxygen are my reactants because they're on the back side of the arrow. The products are in a, this should be a subscript, in a two, right? O, right there, because the arrow is pointing at them. So this would be my product. All right. So we know about coefficients. We know about reactants. We know about products. Okay. We know about subscripts and how they affect the number of elements. Let's put them all together. Okay, Oops, go the other way. Law of conservation of mass. I'm going to highlight this because this is important. Okay, we want to definitely know the law of conservation of mass. Okay, um, the law of conservation of mass tells us that you cannot create or destroy mass. Whatever amount of reactants you start with, you have to finish with. Okay, now I want to point something out because people always bring this up. What about burning a piece of wood? Because when you burn a piece of wood, that's definitely a chemical reaction, but the ashes definitely weigh less than the wood that you start with. That's totally true. So we have to be able to explain that too. So let's just talk about the wood first. Then we'll get back to this. So when you combust something, you are converting stored energy in the bonds into um, actual energy, right? So if you've ever seen this equation before, E equals mc squared, 
um, which is a pretty famous equation. We're saying that mass, which is the M, can be transformed into energy. So if you lose mass, all right, from your, um, your starting material, then it must have been turned into energy. And when we think about burning, we definitely know that there's a lot of energy produced. It's produced in the form of heat. Heat is a form of energy. I can stand there and like warm my hands over the fire, okay? So don't think about it in terms of that. We want to think about it in terms of our uh, balanced equation, right? So if I'm just looking at what I have written, N2 and H2 makes uh, NH3, I'm going to divide these two sides in half, okay? Actually, I'm gonna make this a little bit neater so I have a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna Because what the law of conservation mass is saying is that the mass on the left, on the reactant side, has to equal the mass on the right. We're talking about it in terms of how many atoms are moving around. So I'm just gonna make a little short list, okay, just so we can look at this. So I have N and H on both sides. Okay, and on this side I have two of each because the subscript tells me I have two, I don't have any coefficients. On this side I have one and I have three, okay? So two and three are hard to make work, but I know if I put a coefficient in here, um, I can change the total number of hydrogens I've got. Well, I can't turn a three into a two because I need to use whole numbers, but I can do the least common um, multiple and I can put a two right here. Now, putting a two there changes it. So I don't have three anymore. I have two times three, which is six. I have two times one, which is two. Now I look at this, I'm like, well, my nitrogens are good, so I don't need to put anything here, but my hydrogens don't match. So what times two is three, or sorry, what times two is six? And the answer is, of course, three. So that gives me six. So I have two and two, six and six. So this must be a one. So that tells me that one molecule of nitrogen plus three molecules of hydrogen gas will combine to produce two molecules of ammonia. And that is balanced. Okay, and let's look at another. We've got Na and O2 on the left. We've got Na2O on the right. So I look at this, I say, all right, well, let's, let's draw it up here again. Let's hash it out. And whenever you balance equations, we're always going to have to do a little bit of scratch work. Draw our line, we have Na and we have O. I have one sodium, I have two oxygens. Over here I have two sodiums and I have one oxygen. So pretty easy. I'm just gonna put a two right here. That gives me two times two, that gives me four sodiums. Two times one gives me two oxygens, okay? Um, we can start there. Yep, there we go. And then I need to fix my sodium, so I would say right, four. That would give me a one, four. That stays a two, four and four, two and two. So I have four, one, and two. Now, a lot of times what kids do is they give me this. They say, hey, there's the answer. And we're like, well, no, they stop at that first one. They say, well, my sodium's good and I have oxygen and oxygen. Don't stop there, right? This is not balanced, okay? Um, and I already did it for you, right? There's the answer, four, one, and two. Okay, but when I look at this, if I stopped right here, I'd only have two sodiums, two oxygens, four sodiums, two oxygens. So it doesn't match, right? Just be careful when you balance. Don't stop too early. Make sure all your numbers work out, all right? So make sure you can tell me where you find chemical symbols for all the different elements, which should be pretty obvious, right? Can you tell me what a chemical reaction is? Okay, what does it show? Be able to spot one. Know where the reactants are and where uh, the products are and know how to balance a chemical equation. And we'll look at a couple more um, balancing problems in the book this week, all right? So if you have questions, let me know. Okay, shoot me an email, um, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you've got, all right? And we'll keep working, all right? So go from there. Let me know if you have any questions.